Good evening, guys, and welcome to this evening's program, History and Highballs, the Evolution of Mortuary Science. Um, this, if this is your first History and Highballs with us, my name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History. So whenever you sign up to join us for one of these History and Highballs programs, you and I get to virtually spend the evening together learning, learning about incredible places and people and what makes our state so special. Um, oops, sorry. There will be a Q&A opportunity at the end of tonight's program. We ask that you please type any questions that you have for our guest speakers into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. Once our speakers have finished their talk, our adult programs intern will ask them as many of your questions as time allows. Also, the Ghost Guild has a special treat for one lucky winner this evening. All you have to do is be present through the end of the program when a random attendee will be chosen. I'll let the Ghost Guild folks tell you more about that. So it's my honor to introduce and welcome back uh, the Ghost Guild, our speakers for this evening. We have Nelson Noss, Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Ghost Guild. We have Danielle, I'm sorry, Danielle, uh, Sharilla, Lori Shamblin, and Melissa Holman, um, who are volunteers for the Ghost Guild. So guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. No, thank you, Stacy. We want to um, extend actually our heartfelt thanks to the North Carolina Museum of History for hosting us um, for our fifth year. This has actually become a cherished part of our annual fall tradition and we look forward to it every year. Um, before we begin, we also want to thank all of you for joining us. Yeah, make sure I, all right, I got this going now, all right. So we're excited to show our appreciation by offering over $300 in prizes for those of you that are attending one of our many October presentations. The prices include uh, bourbon sensory training experience at Mystic Farms and Distillery in Durham, uh, tickets to the Cary Corpse Crawl, a ghost tour in Cary, a collection of signed books by award-winning author Thomas Smith, a $50 gift certificate to Death and Taxes Restaurant in Raleigh, and I Got Haunted by the Mordecai Ghost t-shirt, as well as more swag uh, from the Ghost Guild. By registering for this presentation, um, you've taken the first step to enter the raffle. Now, uh, all you need to do is sit back and enjoy until the end, and then we'll select one lucky winner. And this winner will actually be entered into the raffle. And on November 1st, we'll randomly assign prizes to each winner. So to recap, if you're selected tonight, you'll receive one of these prizes, but you won't know which one until November 1st. So allow me to uh, briefly introduce myself. Uh, I'm Nelson Noss. I'm the executive director and co-founder for the Ghost Guild. Originally, I'm from Montreal, Canada, and French is my first language. I volunteer for the Ghost Guild on weeknights and weekdays, but during the weekday, I work in a regular job in healthcare IT, uh, specifically data and analytics for a large academic medical center in Chapel Hill. Now, the Ghost Guild is a registered nonprofit organization driven by volunteers who share a passion for history, science, and the unexplained. Uh, early on, we decided not to take on personal or residential cases, um, choosing to focus instead on historical sites and societies. So by partnering with these organizations, we help them reach a broader audience by adding mystery to their history and showing that history can be fun and fascinating for those that may not yet realize it. So when it comes to investigating claims of paranormal activity, we take the scientific approach. This involves using the scientific method, which includes observing, gathering data, forming hypotheses, and then conducting experiments to test those hypotheses. Uh, scientific approach does not mean using electronic equipment or gadgets. While we may occasionally use them, they do not guide our work. So we emphasize critical thinking throughout the process. Since we formed in 2017, we've conducted 115 investigations across 56 locations in 10 states. Uh, each one has helped us uncover more about the past and its mysteries. Now, including myself, um, the Ghost Guild currently has 10 volunteers. You'll get to meet three more this evening and they'll introduce themselves as they start their part of the presentation. 
Tonight, we're exploring the evolution of mortuary science. Uh, this field encompasses the study and the preparation of deceased bodies for burial uh, or cremation, uh, as well as the emotional aspects of grieving and the operations of funeral homes. It's important to note that each state has its own laws regarding funerals and cremation services, and we simply don't have enough time to address those differences in this presentation. Our focus will range from ancient Egypt to contemporary trends in mortuary science today. Uh, given the vast time span and the limited, of time, a limited amount of time that we have, uh, we, this won't be all inclusive. Um, while we'll start in ancient Egypt, it's important to recognize that burial um, and cremation practices date back even further. The earliest known burials conducted in caves and other natural settings date back around 100,000 years. Additionally, the earliest evidence of cremation can be traced to around 20,000 BCE in Australia. So with that, I'm gonna transfer it over to Lori. Hello everyone, I'm Lori Shamblin. I am a project manager with the Ghost Guild and um, I am also a trained death doula. So researching um, the history and information for this presentation was quite illuminating and fascinating for me. So I hope it will be for you as well. Next slide. So again, as Nelson said, we're starting in ancient Egypt. Um, the Egyptians are actually credited with being the first to practice embalming, um, best described as the treatment of the human body after death to sterilize it or to slow decomposition. They were already preserving meat, fish, fowl by salting, smoking, and sun drying and heating. So it is thought that the earliest mummies were likely accidental, preserved by the dry sand and the air of the Egyptian desert. Because the Egyptians believed that preserving the body was for further use in the afterlife, embalming was just one step of a more elaborate mummification process to stop decomposition for any period. Although developed by the ancient Egyptians, mummification has been practiced by other cultures, and Egyptians began intentionally mummifying the dead around 2600 BCE. The process was elaborate, and it took upwards of 70 days, and it went something like this. A slit was made along the left side of the abdomen, and with the exception of the heart, the brain, stomach, liver, lungs, and intestines were removed and placed in canopic jars. The body was then covered in natron, a natural salt mixture, to absorb moisture and dehydrate the tissues, and the body was rinsed with palm wine and herbs and then filled with spices. They packed the bodies with sawdust and linen bandages, some soaked in resins to give it a more lifelike appearance. And then the body was finally wrapped in linen bandages, starting from the feet and working upwards. And then they covered it with a gum. Amulets and talismans were placed between the bandages to protect the deceased in the afterlife. Next slide, please. Next slide. Nelson? Yep, I'm trying, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay, I don't know why, no, I, was, it just, I was clicking, clicking, clicking and it wasn't moving. I was right, afraid my, my Wi-Fi glitched, okay, good. <laughs> in mythology, Anubis was an ancient Egyptian god of the dead who played a central role in the afterlife, including guiding souls, embalming, and protecting the dead. Represented as an anthropomorphized jackal, Anubis was also the protector of graves and cemeteries, and he would punish those who violated tombs or offended the gods. He is credited with inventing the mummification process. And again, the Egyptians believed that the mummification process was very important for ensuring a happy afterlife. Next slide. Is it not showing? Oh, it is, sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> this mask of Anubis was worn by the priest who was responsible for the embalming. During the process of mummification, the ears of Anubis are always erect to show the thoughtful attitude of the jackal as a protector god of the necropolis. And now as we trans transition into ancient Greece and talk about Homer's works, 
the underworld or Hades was depicted as a bleak place for most people with only a few suffering eternal punishments. Persephone is known as the queen of the underworld, goddess of the dead. And the myth says that when Persephone was in human form, her uncle Hades, the god of the dead, abducted her and carried her to the underworld. Figures of Persephone are considered to provide protection and assurance of a happy afterlife. Like Egyptians, ancient Greek funeral practices were deeply influenced by their religious beliefs and cultural values, with a focus on honoring the deceased and ensuring their safe passage into the afterlife. The Greeks had elaborate burial rituals that came in three parts and were usually conducted by relatives, primarily women. The rituals included the prothesis, which is the laying out of the body, the ekphora, which is the funeral procession, and the interment or the burial or cremation. Cremation was a common funeral practice in ancient Greece, especially in Athens, and was used as early as the Homeric era. Cremation was a common funeral practice in ancient Greece. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it may have been introduced as early as 1000 BCE and was mentioned in Homer's Iliad. The dead would be washed and a coin placed in their mouth to pay the ferrymen for taking the loved ones across the river Styx into the underworld. They mainly practice burials, but here we also see cremation become a more common practice. Mummification was not initially one of the practices, but after Egypt conquered Greece, they adopted it. And now on to the Greco-Roman period. The Greeks believed that the spirit of the dead left the body as a puff of wind at the moment of death. The Romans closed the eyes and the mouths of the, de the deceased, which may have originally been for cosmetic reasons, but later took on a very spiritual significance. The river Styx, one of the most well-known rivers in Greek mythology, serves as a powerful symbol of the boundary between life and death. The Romans believed that the dead could not pass the Styx River into the underworld without a burial or cremation ceremony. Death and burial practices were similar to what we know today. The dead were interred, but instead of being buried in a cemetery or graveyard, as today, bodies were buried outside of the city walls along the road leading into a city. It is thought that this was done to prevent the spreading of disease. The treatment of the deceased was based on their social status when they were alive. For example, in Rome, the preparation of the body for an upper class was entrusted to professional undertakers. The, um, the bodies were buried in coffins made of wood, clay, or stone, um, or in chamber walls. The Romans used a marble sarcophagus to bury bodies intact and urns to store ashes from cremations. And the dead were often laid out in their wedding attire. The Romans had a funeral procession that was led by musicians, followed by mourning women and sometimes players and buffoons, which are similar to a clown or a court jester or a comedian. They completed the funeral with a ritual feast to provide closure for the family. Both the Greeks and the Romans practiced um, cremation and inhumation. However, the Greeks preferred burial for the poor while the Romans preferred cremation during the late Republic, Republican, Republican Empire. Even the most modest funerals for Rome citizens would be expensive, especially for the majority who were not wealthy. The poorest Romans, along with certain criminals, were sometimes simply dumped in pits or rivers or just left to decompose outside. During times of plague or pandemic, the system for handling the dead could become completely overwhelmed. Those who died unexpectedly or without proper funeral rites were believed to haunt the living as restless spirits until they could be exorcised. Now transitioning to the medieval period, when cremation was um, largely illegal in Europe actually, and it was only used in certain circumstances such as cases of punishment or as a precaution against the spread of disease. King Charlemagne, Charlemagne outlawed cremation in 789 CE because he believed that destroying the body was the same as destroying the soul. Burial was a preferred method because of the Christian belief in the bodily resurrection. And during this period, embalming involved preserving bodies using herbs, spices, cotton, balsam, and quicksilver. Physicians and surgeons were the ones that completed the embalming process using the following techniques. They would fill the mouth, ears, and nose with cotton, incense, aloe, myrrh, or oakum. They rubbed the body with white wine and herbs, stuffing the throat with herbs and spices and cotton, and rubbing the body again with balsam, putting quicksilver in the mouth, ears, and nostrils. This practice could keep the, the body presentable for up to a week. Funeral, funerals during this period were solemn, 
respectful, and Christian-influenced ceremonies that reflected the belief in an afterlife. Priests and clergy led the procession reciting prayers and psalms, and the cross was carried as a symbol of hope and resurrection. Family and friends followed in the funeral procession, and they wore specific clothing to indicate their relationship to the deceased. And then neighbors and town folks um, followed in behind that procession. Burial practices included using charcoal, ashes, gravel, small stones, plants, flowers, and urns. Many churches had coffins that could be borrowed or leased to transport the deceased to the burial. Coffins were used to bury the dead, but the type of coffin depended on who was inside. Coffins were, um, co wooden coffins were made from a tree trunk split down the middle and hollowed out. Those were the coffins that were used by people that could not afford one. Lead coffins were used for the wealthy and important and were shaped like sarcophagus. Stone coffins were also used by the wealthy and were rectangular in shape with a rounded top. And then there was no coffin. They were wrapped in cloth and covered in hay and flowers. When there was no space for bodies in the cemeteries during the plague, bodies were either dismembered and put in ossuaries that they built to hold the skulls and leg bones of the deceased, or they were thrown in pits, um, burn pits, if, if there were too many people. The church also ensured that sacred ground remained sacred and that the dead were buried in consecrated ground. The cemeteries were part of the town and they were considered in a social environment where people would gather and they would drink and they would gamble. And what would seem to be in direct conflict with the deeply held solemn, respectful and Christian beliefs, prostitutes also frequented the cemeteries. Funerals for those who died a good death were elaborate and included the washing of the body, a vigil, and masses. Prone burials, which is the practice of um, burying a body face down, were used for people who were discriminated against, disabled, executed, or considered sexually deviant. Medieval Christians held the belief that upon death, their souls would be judged and placed in one of three realms, heaven, hell, or purgatory. The exceptionally righteous were believed to ascend directly to heaven where they would experience eternal bliss. And conversely, those who led wicked lives and showed no remorse for their sins were thought to be condemned to an eternal suffering in hell. And on that lighter note, I will now turn it over to my friend, Danny. Thank you, Lori. Hello, everybody. My name is Danny Shirella, and I'm an archivist by day and researcher for the Ghost Guild by night. So I'm going to go ahead and take us into colonial America. When we think of burials, the obvious image that comes to mind is a coffin or casket slowly descending underground. But even though this is the norm today, it wasn't until 1700 that British law permitted people of all classes to be buried in coffins. Before then, as Lori mentioned, it was only the wealthy who had that privilege. The only type of coffin lower classes would have encountered at this time was the parish coffin, which was just a vessel used to transport the deceased from the church to the graveside. This change in British law impacted burial practices in the American colonies, causing coffin usage to become more widespread after 1700. Seeing as this was a new development before funeral homes were a common business, cabinet and furniture makers would make coffins as needed and they would also work as undertakers, which at this point meant that they would put the dead bodies into the coffins and make funeral arrangements for grieving families. Buckchart was a cabinet making business in Colonial Williamsburg and actually became the first official funeral home in the colonies. Eventually, Anthony Hay, the founder of Bucktrout, expanded his business to also become the first funeral home to own and operate its own crematory. After they opened in 1759, more and more cabinet makers across the country transitioned to the funeral business. And fun fact, Bucktrout is still fully operational today. And that brings us to the Victorian era. While funeral homes started cropping up in the late 1700s, it didn't become a formal profession until the late 1800s. During the Victorian era, mourning customs were heavily influenced by Queen Victoria's response to Prince Albert's untimely death. Prince Albert died of typhoid fever in December of 1861 at the age of, 14, at the age of 42. Because of this, Queen Victoria fell into a deep depression and experienced a longing to die herself for the first three years after his death. 
She withdrew from public life for over a decade, spending four months out of each year away from Windsor Castle. She required members of the royal household to dress in all black in public for the first year after Prince Albert's death, herself wearing black for the remainder of her life. This set the tone for mourning for the foreseeable future, as we still wear black to funerals today. Outside of the royal realm, disease was plaguing society. Whether it was due to typhoid, cholera, tuberculosis, or rubella, many mothers died while giving birth and many children didn't reach the age of five. With death surrounding many, families often stored the corpse of their loved one in their parlor, allowing them to spend more time with them and let others visit the dead before burial. This led to the parlor to becoming known as the death room, as this was where one could often find the dead. You can probably guess what it's called now. In the 1840s, coffin usage was pretty much the norm across socioeconomic classes, so of course the wealthy had to come up with some new coffin to set them apart from the rest of society. Enter Dr. Almond Fisk. Dr. Fisk patented the steel casket, or Fisk metallic burial case, in 1848. This case was custom formed to the body, resembling an Egyptian sarcophagus with sculpted arms and a glass window plate for viewing the face of the deceased, without having to smell a decomposing body or risk being exposed to any pathogens if they died of disease. While pine coffins in the 1850s would have cost around $2, a Fisk coffin could command a price upwards of $100, hence its popularity with affluent families. The cost did come with benefits, as the airtight casket made for better preservation of the corpse if a delayed funeral was needed, and the steel structure was nearly indestructible, making it much harder for grave robbers to open the casket. Clearly, this isn't a common practice now, which is due to the Metallic Burial Case Company going under in 1888, as reported by the New York Times. As we move into the Civil War, we start to see the mass production of wooden caskets instead of them being made as needed to align with the increased American deaths from fighting in the war. Soldiers often died far away from their homes, so preservation of the corpse became a concern. The introduction of embalming was crucial to ensuring that soldiers returned to their families in decent condition for the funeral. Multiple people are credited with the invention of embalming, but perhaps the most significant development was Alexander Butlerov's discovery of formaldehyde in 1855. This eventually replaced the previously used arsenic and created the foundation for embalming methods still in use today. This is also around the time where the beautification of death became common, as soldiers often died of horrific wounds and needed to be cleaned up before their family saw them. This practice would grow into something we now know as mortuary cosmetology in the 1970s and 80s, but today it's more about putting makeup on dead people than sewing body parts back together, for the most part at least. While already widely used, embalming became a staple of our funeral practices when Abraham Lincoln was embalmed. As many of you know, President Lincoln was assassinated in 1865 while attending a play at Ford's Theater. Lincoln was embalmed by Charles Brown, who also embalmed Lincoln's son, Willie, three years earlier when he died from typhoid. Then, Lincoln laid in state in the East Room of the White House and then the Capitol Rotunda for three days after his death before boarding the Lincoln Special Funeral Train. This held both the bodies of President Lincoln himself and his son and followed a route from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois, stopping along the way for various memorials attended by hundreds of thousands. Before the Lincolns were formally laid to rest in Illinois, it's estimated that one million Americans were able to view their bodies. After this, embalming was adopted across the country. During the Reconstruction era, funerals were held outside of the home way more often. Coupled with the increase in people going to the hospital for health care, outsourcing funerals was a convenient development for families, as no one had to stay up with the body all night. Instead, bodies would first go to the morgue, then the funeral home for embalming, and then the location of the funeral, which could often accommodate more attendees than just a parlor. As dead bodies were no longer kept at home, what was once known as the death room became known as the living room, as you probably guessed, with the term being officially coined in 1910. In 1876, Dr. Lemoyne performed the first cremation in the United States. Lemoyne thought that decomposing bodies were contaminating local water supply, potentially affecting the public's health. Naturally, he thought to burn the bodies instead of burying them to resolve this issue. 
Lemoyne's crematory was designed so that the flames never actually touched the body, which became the standard for years. While some contested cremation for religious purposes, the process was lauded by medical professionals. This, crema this crematory was closed in 1901 after 42 cremations, and Lemoyne was the third to be cremated here. His remains actually are buried in the front of this former crematory. Post-reconstruction saw funeral directing become a full-time profession. Joseph Henry Clark organized the first ever embalming class in 1882, which led him to founding the Clark School at the end of the 19th century. This was the first embalming school in the United States. It would be renamed the Cincinnati College of Embalming in 1966 and is now known as the Cincinnati College of Mortuary Science. Embalming laws vary by state. For example, in California, a body must be embalmed or refrigerated if it's not buried or cremated within 24 hours, while Mississippi says 48 hours, so these embalming schools kept all that straight. Also in 1898, the National Funeral Directors Association was established to address the need for formalized training of funeral directors, standardizing the process as a whole and bringing this into the 20th century. Hi everyone, I'm Melissa Holman. I'm part of the social media team for um, the Ghost Guild. And we will be now moving into the 20th century. So as we enter the 20th century, the landscape of mortuary science is evolving significantly. So while death rates are declining, the number of funeral homes are actually increasing as we enter the 20th century. Um, but as far as death rates, that's going to change as soon as we start hitting um, mid-century for the world wars. Um, the establishment of the National Funeral Directors Association was also pivotal. Uh, it set ethical standards and formal training that elevated the profession's recognition and quality. In 1913, the Cremation Association of America was also formed and served a similar purpose for the practice of cremation. Further changes is urbanization, which further influenced um, the shift as families moved to cities, creating a greater need for funeral services. This is com com compounded excuse me, by increased immigration, prompting funeral homes to adapt to diverse religious and cultural practices. Advances in embalming techniques allowed families more time to plan personalized memorials, and these factors led to a dramatic increase in the number of funeral homes, which had doubled by 1920, which was just in time to again meet the heightened demand of our First World War. Next slide. So funerals and the rituals associated with mourning were always fundamental to several processes. Um, so how we grieve, how we reinforce social ties, and how we expand our social safety net in times of vulnerability and loss. More fundamentally, these practices reflect what it means to be human, to love and to connect. Cultural practices surrounding death vary widely across the globe, yet they share a common infrastructure of bonding and collective gathering. So for example, state funerals are a public funeral. Um, so observing the strict rules of protocol held to honor people of national significance. Um, our example that we have here today is John F. Kennedy's funeral, which after he was assassinated, his uh, state funeral was the first ever to be televised. So for 70 hours without interruption, millions witnessed the ceremonies as they unfolded. The following day, Kennedy's casket was taken to the Capitol Rotunda, where over 250,000 people came to pay their respects. The assassination of JFK in 1963 and the extensive television coverage that followed represented a pivotal moment in TV history, arguably more significant than the moon landing in 1969, um, or the events of September 11, 2001. During his funeral procession, astonishing 93% of homes with TVs tuned in, making it the largest viewing audience that was ever recorded at that time. This moment exemplified um, how shared experiences of the morning can unify a nation and highlight the importance of, a com of coming to terms with loss. Next up we have in 1963, 
when uh, Pope John Paul VI lifted the long standing ban on cremation. This decision was a turning point for practicing Catholics to choose cremation as an option. Um, however, it's important to note that while cremation became permissible within the Catholic Church, the Church emphasized the importance of a proper ceremony. And they stipulated that ashes would need to be buried rather than scattered. This change in policy coupled with evolving religions, religious attitudes towards death and remembrance uh, led to resurgence of the practice of cremation by the 1980s. Families began to embrace this option and then seeing it as a meaningful way to um, honor their loved ones while also adhering to the church's guidelines. Cremated bodies are typically interned in urns or placed in crypts, and that provides respectful resting places that aligns with the church's techniques, teachings, sorry. This practice allows families to maintain a connection to their deceased, offering a tangible location for remembrance and prayer. Moving on to the 21st century, we are revisiting funeral directors in the 21st century. So funeral directors still serve as vital members of their communities. They provide essential support to the families during one of uh, life's most challenging times. They help individuals and families navigate the grieving process and express their emotions in a respectful and meaningful way. So one of the primary responsibilities of funeral directors is planning. They assist families in organizing the date, time, and location of the funeral, as well as coordinating wakes, memorial ceremonies, and burial arrangements. So these logistical supports are crucial as it allows families to focus on honoring their loved ones while entrusting details to a professional. In addition to planning, funeral directors offer guidance. They help families understand how to properly dispose of, of the deceased body, whether through burial or cremation. They also assist in filling out necessary forms, navigating the complex landscape of funeral laws, and ensuring that all legal requirements are met. And one of the most significant aspects of a funeral director's role is the emotional support that they provide. They are often a source of comfort and advice for families and friends of the deceased, helping to address the emotional needs of the bereaved by offering a listening ear and compassionate support. Funeral directors help individuals process their grief and find solace in their memories. So a couple areas of advancement have occurred, in the, especially in cosmetic restoration techniques. So technological improvements have allowed for more detailed and lifelike appearances during the preparation of the deceased. Funeral professionals can now achieve finer details that provide comfort to grieving families, helping to create more serene and natural presentations of their loved ones. In today's society, the choice of burial location can often reflect socioeconomic status, Affluent individuals are frequently laid to rest in prestigious cemeteries, which can offer beautifully landscaped grounds, elaborate monuments, and a sense of historical significance. In contrast, those with limited resources may find themselves buried in community cemeteries. These spaces, while more modest, will provide a respectful place for remembrance and honoring loved ones. Additionally, there are some burial grounds for specific demographics that are unrelated to socioeconomic status. So for example, military burial grounds offer a dignified resting place for veterans, providing them with honors and recognition for their service. These sites often maintained with great care, symbolize the gratitude of a nation and serve as a poignant reminder of sacrifices made by those who served. The most common method of burial is inhumation. Inhumation is where the body is buried underground and this allows for traditional grave markers and memorials. Additionally, there's above ground burial, which can take the form of tombs or mausoleums. These structures provide an elegant alternative to ground burial, um, and this often allows family to visit and maintain a central place, place for remembrance. Changes in embalming um, in the 21st century, one notable development is a reduced use of formaldehyde in embalming. While it was very widely used in the past, we now rec recognize its potential health risks, leading to a concerted effort to find less toxic alternatives. This shift 
now reflects the growing awareness of health and safety for both funeral professionals and families. Additionally, stricter laws and regulations now govern chemicals used in embalming fluids. This ensures safety for both the process and the environment. Research into environmentally friendly embalming fluids is also on the rise, exploring biodegradable materials. Coincidingly, there has also been growing interest in natural burials, also known as green or eco-friendly burial. This process involves burying the body directly in the ground without the use of a vault or traditional casket, and typically without embalming. So instead, the body is wrapped in cotton, placed in a biodegradable container that is made from natural materials like bamboo, and then this practice emphasizes a return to nature, and minimizes the environmental impact associated with traditional burial methods. Natural burial sites often are in serene settings. They reflect the desire for more organic connection to the environment. Similarly, there are conservation burial grounds, which take the concept of a green burial a little step further. These sites are permanently protected um, as natural environments, ensuring that the land remains untouched and preserved for future generations. This method contrasts sharply with traditional burial practices, which often require significant resources, including lawn maintenance and concrete encasements for caskets. So together, these innovations enhance the ecological responsibility of mortuary practices and cater to families seeking sustainable options. There has also been a noticeable shift in societal views and an increased awareness of the need for more eco-friendly options. Many now view cremation as a viable alternative to traditional burial. One of the most significant advancements with cremation has been in technology, particularly, particularly with the introduction of gas power cremation chambers. Then this allows for better temperature control during the crema cremation part process and it makes it more efficient and environmentally conscious. So, this not only improves the experience for funeral homes, but also addresses concerns about emissions and the ecological impact of cremation. We've also witnessed a change in religious acceptance for cremation. So recognizing that it can be a respectful option for the deceased, at the same time, there has been a rise in secular practices surrounding death as more individuals and families choose to commemorate their loved ones in ways that reflect their personal beliefs and values rather than strictly adhering to traditional rituals, traditional religious rituals. So now all of this um, com coming together has turned cremation into the new normal. So what might not be so normal yet are the creative ways that those ashes are being honored. So let's explore those um, diverse options and creative ways that we can honor a loved one's ashes in the 21st century. Um, we're, we'll start off with some more traditional methods. So scattering ashes, it continues to be a personal and meaningful way to let go. Whether it be in the ocean or the mountains, families choose special locations that hold significance for their loved ones, creating a lasting memory in a place they cherish. Just be sure to follow state laws and acquire proper permissions when doing so. Another option is getting an ornate urn which is another traditional yet elegant option. Families can select a design that reflects their loved one's personality, providing a safe space for the ashes and serving as a beautiful memorial. Another option is to divide the ashes among family and friends, and this enables everyone to be able to keep part of their loved one close and foster connection and shared remembrance. So cremation jewelry, jewelry has been on the rise lately as well. And this allows for families to keep a small part of their loved ones close to their heart. And these beautiful keepsakes come in various designs, serving as a constant reminder of the bond shared. For a more unique tribute, um, cremation diamonds offer an innovative way to memori memorialize a loved one by transforming their ashes into a stunning diamond. So this process provides a tangible and beautiful way for it to carry their memory with you. Another thoughtful choice is planting a tree using a biodegradable urn. So this not only creates a living memorial, but also contributes to the environment, symbolizing growth and renewal in honor of the deceased. And for those who love the ocean, 
placing the ashes in the concrete of an artificial coral reef offers a creative and impactful way to memorialize their loved ones as well. So this not only honors their memory, but also supports marine life and ecosystems. In a more, conven in a more unconventional approach, um, but definitely artistic, you can commemorate your loved one with a portrait or a tattoo that incorporates their cremated ashes into the ink, creating a personal and lasting tribute. And ashes can even be transformed into music. So some companies offer creative, offers create vinyl records from the ashes, and this allows families to listen to a physical representation of their loved one's memory. And then moving on to cremation fireworks, <laughs> also known as memorial fireworks or ash scattering fireworks. Um, they're also a very unique way to commemorate and honor the life of a departed loved one. And for my personal favorite, <laughs> if flying high is not uh, high enough for you, um, you might be seeking a truly out of this world tribute. Um, and then that's where space burial comes into play because space burial allows for a small portion of ashes to be sent into space. Several companies offer the service enabling the ashes to orbit the earth and travel to other celestial bodies. Notably, in 1998, Celestis conducted its first ever space funeral by launching the ashes of Dr. Eugene Shoemaker, the founder of astrogeology, aboard a NASA spacecraft. Another innovative option, which is gaining traction, is alkaline hydrolysis. So it's also called water cremation. This alternative to cremation and burial employs a hydrolysis chamber to gently break down the body using heat, water pressure, and lye. So this process results in a benign liquid known as hydrosilate, hydrolysate, sorry, which can be safely returned to the environment and this offers a compassionate and eco-friendly choice for disposition. And last but not least, um, if ashes or hydrolysate are your thing, <laughs> Some states now allow human composting, also known as natural organic reduction. It uses the same idea as the standard composting to provide an environmentally friendly alternative to traditional options like burials and cremation. So the body is placed into a steel container and with substances like wood, chips, and alfalfa, and in 30 days, it has morphed into compost. The compost may be used in a memorial garden um, for planting trees and for scattering. And for whoever is interested, they are currently legal in California, Colorado, New York, Oregon, Vermont, and Washington. And there are several other states that are also currently in the process of passing legislation to legalize it. And now I will pass it over to Nelson. Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> to close out our presentation, uh, we'd like to highlight an iconic Raleigh landmark that played a key role in the uh, evolution of um, mortuary science right here in our own backyard. And since it is October, and this location ranks amongst the top 10 most haunted locations in Raleigh, we'll share some of its mysterious stories and findings from our investigation there. The H.J. Brown Coffin House building was the early 20th century headquarters for a local business established in 1836. Originally a cabinet shop and later a maker of coffins, it evolved into an undertaking and mortuary company that would become Raleigh's oldest continuously operating business. The company relocated several times and eventually made its way to the corner of Salisbury and Hargett Street in 1907. Now, upon its completion, the Raleigh Times reported, this building represents one of the handsomest building homes of any house in its kind in the entire Southern states. This article went on to describe each level. The first contained a reception room parlor and offices. The second served as a showroom or sample room. And the third was used as a stock room in the engraving department. 
Now, this is a picture of the HGA Coffin House in, in the background with its fleet of four hearses parked along Hargett Street. In 1915, the company was the first to bring motorized hearses to Raleigh, which replaced the horse-drawn hearses previously used. Here's one of those. Um, actually, you can see the now historic Raleigh Water Tower in the background. Now, during the Spanish flu uh, epidemic, the H.J. Brown uh, company handled the challenges posed, and some say that bodies were piled high in the basement. In 1928, the H.J. Brown Company relocated to a new building. The building then housed a series of banks and underwent this unfortunate architectural makeover in the 1970s. And this is likely the scariest thing you've seen tonight. Fortunately, James Goodnight purchased the property in 2012. Uh, and he painstakingly returned it to its original glory. In 2015, Ashley Christensen opened the restaurant Death and Taxes, an homage to the building's history as a bank and a funeral home. Now, many of its mysterious stories originate during this restoration, such as the worker who reported safeguarding their tools in the elevator and positioning between floors before turning the power off to the building. Then on several occasions, returning to find the elevator had moved to a different floor. On another occasion, the young daughter of a contractor reported conversing with a nice man that only she could see. Since its reopening as death and taxes, employees have reported seeing a tall, slender man in a suit from the corner of their eye in the stairwells. Other experiences include feelings of being watched, hair being pulled, and hearing someone say, hey, while working in the basement. Intriguingly, security camera footage allegedly showed a chandelier spinning in circles even when the building was unoccupied. One night, the security system reported activity and upon reviewing the footage, loud screaming was heard, yet no one was in the building. Out of curiosity, we tested whether it could have been outside noise, and one of our former teammates yelled at the top of their lungs for a few minutes, drawing some strange looks from passerbys, uh, but we couldn't hear it inside the building at all. Unfortunately, that security footage uh, has been, was discarded uh, years ago. So while we didn't experience any of these reported activities during our investigation, we did experience one thing on the third floor of the building. The third floor is known as the Bridge Club. It's an event space that's laid out with three rows of wood top tables and lightweight aluminum chairs. On the night of our investigation, three of us rotated every 45 minutes to cover different floors. And the second investigator stationed on the third floor experienced something unusual, but chose to wait until I had my turn before sharing it with me. After about 10 minutes on the third floor, I began hearing what is a tinny sound from the back of the room, then again from the other end of the room. I tried to pinpoint the source, but the sound seemed to move. It lacked a specific cadence. It was occurring at random intervals. Upon returning to the main floor, I compared notes with the other investigator who had experienced the exact same thing. So we paused our rotations and returned to the third floor together. The sounds resumed and even seemed to move with me as I walked across the room. We were finally able to recreate the sound by striking a chair seat with an open hand. And given that aluminum expands and contracts with temperature changes, we hypothesized that the sounds were due to thermal expansion, particularly with the air conditioning running intermittently in the room. So the cooling followed by gradual warming might have caused the chair seats to pop. This brings us to the principle of Occam's razor the problem solving principle that recommends searching for explanations constructed with the smallest possible set of elements. Applying this principle would lead us to dismiss these sounds as simply the results of the air conditioning. However, part of us is eager to test this theory further without 
And without further experiments, it's difficult to determine if this would result in the same intensity of sounds that we heard. So for now, this remains a mystery that is yet to be solved. So before I hand this back over to Stacy, we do have some announcements that we, uh, in public events that we wanted to share with you all. Um, we do have some other presentations that are upcoming. We have another virtual presentation, uh, which is with Wake County Public Libraries, and we will be covering, uh, can objects be cursed or haunted? So that is on the 24th, and you do need to register for that. It's available on our website uh, or Wake County Public Libraries website. We also have some in-person presentations. We have two presentations left of our Spirit of the Law, which mixes um, funny or interesting cases where the paranormal uh, were, was included in uh, case law. Um, we also share some of our uh, data from um, some of our investigations as part of that presentation as well. We have one presentation left of Loring Destination which is where we take you through eight different sites um, across our beautiful state of North Carolina and share with you some of the stories and lore in hopes that you'd want to go and visit those places for yourself. And we can't forget um, our Haunted Mordecai presentation this year, and we're extremely excited about how we're going to be doing it. We've, we're changing the format. We typically have been presenting in the classroom, um, and this is where we present our findings from our investigations of Mordecai Historic Park. Uh, but in presenting in the classroom is um, where you all just sat down and just watched us. Uh, this is going to be much more engaging. What we've been uh, authorized to do is actually walk, walk you all to the buildings and then inside the buildings, and then we'll share with you some of the data that we've collected from our investigations at Mordecai, uh, and we'll be sharing that data with you exactly where it was collected. So that is on the 26th. Uh, you do need to go to the visitor center earlier on and request a free ticket. Um, and we hope you will consider joining us for that. We also do an annual uh, public investigation across, uh, aboard the USS North Carolina. Uh, we do not have our date yet, but we will be announcing it to our VIP mailing list first, making those tickets available uh, to those members. So um, please consider going to our website and signing up for our VIP list so you'll receive that notification if you're interested in partaking in uh, a paranormal investigation uh, where we will lead you and just as though you are a member of the team and uh, spend the night aboard the ship. And if you are local to the area, we do want to bring up our Spirits and Spooks. It is like a meetup group. Uh, it is a monthly gathering of people. Uh, it is judgment free. So like-minded people get together and talk about their stories, um, whether it be paranormal or or whatever, we just have, we have a good time together. So uh, if you'd like to go to Spirits and Spooks on Facebook, uh, just ask to um, be, or ask uh, to join and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do that for you. And then you'll get those notifications. And if you're interested in any of the things I've just mentioned, here is a QR code that will take you um, to links where you can register for those. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to um, back to you all, Stacey. And... Hey, guys, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that presentation and stuff. So I'm going to ask some questions that were dropped below down in the chat box during the presentation and stuff. So our first one is from one of the viewers, and they were kind of wondering, um, how did uh, the Ghost Guild kind of get started and stuff? And can you explain more of that? I know we kind of touched on that a little bit at the beginning of the presentation, but I think they're more interested in trying to figure out how you all came together and maybe like your own personal experiences on joining that. Well, um, I, I I can share that. Um, and, and for those that have already heard the story, I apologize. But uh, I had an experience as a child and it marked me for a very long time. And it wasn't until I moved to North Carolina and uh, found a meetup group uh, of 
people that actually met to discuss paranormal occurrences or experiences that they've had. Um, and I joined one of those meetings and it allowed me to finally um, open up about the experience that I had as a child. And ever since then, I've been wanting to try to, I don't know if it'll happen, but I want, I want to see if I can possibly explain what I experienced as a child. Um, so that's kind of how I got started in it. Uh, and I started joining um, different people on their investigations for a short period of time. I joined another team and there I met uh, two other people uh, and we decided to um, form our own organization. Uh, and that's how the Ghost Guild uh, was founded. And now we've been going for eight years and um, yeah, we've, we've got a great group. Um, everyone that does this, they do it because they enjoy it because it's, it's work and they're, it's all volunteer work. They wish we got paid for this, but uh, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, awesome. So another question that we have here, um, someone's wondering if you found any connection between stories of how someone was laid to rest and whether or not they became a ghost or in other words, are there questions of it of places that are haunted tied to people who are buried there? There's certainly a lot of lore. I mean, the most stories, I mean, we're uh, like, just to tie in even to uh, one of our current presentations, the alluring destinations where we go to Asheville and there's a, a basilica there and there's someone interred in it that is um, believed to haunt that church. Uh, so there's a lot of stories associated like that to to people that have died and potentially haunting uh, certain locations. Um, I, I will state that science has yet to prove that uh, ghosts do exist. So we don't know everything that, you know, is speculation um, and hauntings aren't necessarily, I mean, we, I think we, we kind of associate hauntings to being so, uh, related to death. Uh, but there are other ideas out there as to what hauntings may be. Um, and so I, I, I don't know how to answer that question, <laughs> um, but uh, there certainly are a lot of stories where um, people, um, people have passed in certain places uh, are believed to haunt those places. I have not, heard of any where the type of burial correlated to a haunting. Um, I think that was part of the question as well. But, yeah. 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 Any okay. other thoughts, um, Melissa or Danny or <laughs> Lori? No? Okay. I think you said yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And so um, someone is directing this towards Nelson. Um, you said that the H.J. Brown Coffin House is listed in the top 10 most haunted places in Raleigh. They're wondering how that was determined or was that just? That is a very good question, John. Um, uh, that is just what is always mentioned. Uh, I don't know what they are um, using uh, to determine that. Uh, I mean, it's 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 like all those articles you see on social media. So like, like everything is the most scary or the most uh, haunted or the most, <laughs> there, there, I don't think that they have a formula um, to determine that. I think it's just uh, for lack of a better word, clickbait. But um, I mean, there is a, a number of locations in Raleigh that always make the lists every October as to which ones are the most haunted. And that just happens to be it. How they select those, I do not know. I don't think there's any science behind it though. Yeah. Okay. And um, so Melissa's wondering, what, where is the Mortuary Museum that you visit, visited recently? So that is in, if I remember, make sure I got it right, it's Fairfax, Virginia, I think. And it is the Simpson Funeral Museum. And it is, um, it was great. We, we definitely enjoyed our visit there. Um, the person that uh, operates it was very friendly, um, very knowledgeable. 
Uh, so we, we got a lot of good information uh, from him and some very interesting pieces in that museum. So, but they do operate by appointment only. So if anyone is interested, um, make sure you contact them before you make your way there. All right. And then unfortunately, we only have time for one more since time is kind of getting short. But um, someone was asking, um, how long does it take to become a mortician? And do you guys know where you could go to school for it and stuff like that? I can take this one from my brief research into this presentation. Um, I believe it takes anywhere from two to five years to become a mortician. And um, one example is the Cincinnati School of Mortuary Science that I talked about. Yeah, awesome. So I'm going to turn it back over to Stacy. And yeah, there you go. Thanks, guys, for your answers and everything. That was great. Well, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Yeah, thank you guys so much. This has been really, really cool. I believe it's time. Um, Nelson's got his his spinny wheel out. So, <laughs> still one sixty seven, correct? Yes. All right, let's do this. Drum roll. <laughs> Number one fifty eight. One fifty eight is Hannah Clark. Um, Hannah, if you're, let's see if you're with us. Let's see if I can see if you're with us. Hang on. Oh, it doesn't look like Hannah's still with us. Oh, no. All right. Let's do another one. Rules are rules. <laughs> 66. All right. Hang tight. Let's see. Do, do, do. Jennifer Randolph. Jennifer. Let's see. Yeah, I'm not getting it. Let's do one more. All right there <laughs> 145 Sasha Newcomb are you still with us Sasha They're not answering either. Oh no. I think you're gonna have to do it again, Nelson. All right, this one will hopefully be the one. <laughs> 61. 61, let's go back up. Suspense is killing me. Oh, this is <laughs> Kathy. This is Kathy that works at the museum with us. <laughs> Kathy, is she still on? Let's see. Hold on. No, she's not. Well, Danny had a really good idea about giving it to Annabeth since they asked the first question. Okay. I'm good with that if you guys are. That is fine with me. I know that we've been doing this. We can go on all night. And <laughs> people have better things to do. Right? All right, Annabelle. So, Annabeth, if you want to drop Annabeth. your um, your email into the chat, we'll share it with the Ghost Guild, and they'll get in touch with you about your special prize that you won. All right, and so, I, oh, there she I, is. So there perfect. There. Okay. And um, for everyone else that was disappointed if they did not win, uh, just let you all know if you attend any of our other presentations, you'll get another opportunity to be entered into our raffle. 
Uh, and as well, if you cannot make another one and you did enjoy this one, if you would like to leave us a review, including the presentation you attended, my light keeps on turning off, uh, what you liked about it and any future topics you would like to, uh, for us to cover. We'd love to get your feedback as to what you'd like to hear. Uh, and then what we'll do is on November 1st, we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Halloween, we will be selecting the team's favorite review and that person will also be entered into our raffle. So there are other, other opportunities to, to enter, but sorry, I am done. <laughs> That's all good. There's a that's a lot of exciting information. So you guys definitely attend some other talks and get your chance to win some cool Ghost Guild swag. Um, Nelson, Lori, Danny, and Melissa, thank you guys so much for sharing all this fascinating history with us. This is a really cool way to celebrate October. So thank you guys. Thank and you. we hope to see all of y'all at our next program, which will actually be our annual American Indian Heritage Celebration that is taking place on Saturday, November 23rd, all day um, at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences here in downtown Raleigh. In the meantime, we hope that you have a great rest of your night and a great rest of your October. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody.